Hi, I'm Tom Chick. Welcome to the Patreon review request video for, uh, it's early June. Uh, if you support me on Patreon for $10 or more, uh, I will solicit you for review requests. And they'll go into a hat, and by a hat I mean these, this piece of paper here where I've printed out all the requests. And we're going to randomly draw one at the end of this video. Now, uh, it's come to my attention that the random number generator dog, which had previously been used, was not entirely random. Uh, dogs, as a fellow named Pavlov might tell you, uh, are slaves to habit. So instead, we're going to use, uh, well, a different method this month. Uh, you'll see what that is shortly. This is also my brand new two camera setup. <laughs> so we're going to have the even, uh, let's go to the odd numbers here, even numbers here. Just because I can. No, uh, no good reason for that. All right, let's get into the choices. What did I say? Odd numbers here, even numbers here. Wait, okay, that's good. Uh, you know what? Odd, even. There. There. I've decided. I think it's backwards from what I originally chose, but it's done. Number one, Greg Ree. There's no two ways about this. Uh, I am coming in so hot right now, he says, exuberantly, with a demand for a thorough review of the Spy Party Early Access Game. It's a game to play with one other person, and it'll make you feel like you've been invited to a party. <laughs> uh, and then he says, by the way, he's really liking Rising Sun. Uh, thanks for the recommendation. He says it has more plastic than the Pacific Ocean. I had to think about that one for a moment, but I, I think I eventually got it. That's number one. These are cards. Watch this. Number one. Request for a spy party. So my, my, uh, so these are not, normally when I write a review, it's not really a recommendation because I don't really have any sense for what you might or might not like. But based on the reviews you're requesting, I'm going to make counter recommendations. So Gregory, there's a game called uh, Spy, no, Party Hard, <laughs> uh, which makes you feel like you haven't been invited to a party and you flip out and kill people because of it. Uh, it's a bit of a goof. Uh, it gets a little frustrating, but it's a cute idea as far as a chaos simulator kind of thing goes. You have to be able to stomach retro graphics, uh, but party hard. There's my counter recommendation. Only slightly in earnest, uh, based on the spy party request. Spy party, I don't know what to make of that. Chris Hecker's been working on that for so long, and it still looks like a simple little, not a gimmick, but just a little simple two-player a uh, bluffing simulator thing. I don't know. Well, maybe it'll get chosen and uh, I'll get a closer look at it. Number two, Andrew Stanko says, last month's video, I mentioned Carpenter Brute. Uh, independently of this excellent choice in music, he says, he's been listening to their album Trilogy nonstop. Uh, he says, apparently, me and Adam, his brother, who's graduating from college, uh, who has graduated from college by the time I'm reading this, congratulations, Adam, uh, but apparently Adam and I have the same taste in music. Uh, can I review Carpenter Brute's trilogy? Yes, Andrew Stanko, if it gets chosen. Uh, my counter recommendation, Carpenter Brute, uh, I think he's been around, he, they, I think it's a he, uh, for a while, but I only stumbled across them uh, a few months ago uh, based on a recommendation by a friend. Uh, and it's also how I found this group that I'm going to counter recommend. They're not as 80s uh, as Carpenter Brute. Uh, they're more sort of poppy, jazzy, uh, weird, but still synth electronica stuff. Uh, they're Norwegian, and they call themselves Exploding Plastics. Beginning with an X, exploding, ending with an X. Plastics. So Carpenter Brute's Trilogy, number two. Trevor Apple says, I'd like to request a review of Pyre. Now, he uh, says, I'm curious why Pyre, which, quote, I must have written this, which I think is why it's quoted, which has a, quote, soccer game glommed onto it. I think I wrote that. Uh, but Golf Story made me realize I wanted, quote, an RPG that had 2D golf instead of combat, end quote. Basically, he's saying, hey, what's the deal? Why Pyre? Like, why not Pyre? But you're okay with Golf Story. What's the deal? Why doesn't Pyre slip in under that exception? Uh, 
Uh, and then he further, he says, I've been wondering about it since my uh, roundup of 2017 games. Uh, he says he hopes a full review of Pyre would give him some insight into my thinking. Uh, and he, he wants to remind me, he says, P.S., I'm not calling you a hypocrite. I'm genuinely wondering what makes a good versus disappointing RPG with sports. Trevor Apple, excellent question. And by the way, uh, your choice of Pyre. Number three. Uh, so I, I, I don't know sports. Um, I am not into, uh, so I, I know the basics like of, of soccer and football and hockey. This idea that a ball or a puck in the, in, in the case of hockey represents uh, contested territory and you want to cluster around that territory and control it. It's a territory control game, right? Uh, with teams. Um, and the idea is you want to move that contested territory into your enemy's end zone, goal, home base, whatever you call it. That doesn't do a lot for me. Uh, uh, team sports in general, I think my issue with team sports is the same issue I have with MOBAs. And that is, I'm only playing, in case of a MOBA, 10% of the game. The other 90% of the game uh, are the other Yahoo's playing, who I have no control over. And I guess I have to cooperate with them. And I was never raised in an environment where I played team sports. So uh, maybe I don't get along with others. Uh, but that, that for me is distinct, the dynamics of that and the whole territory control game, which yeah, you know, I'll just go play a war game with a victory point hex or something. Uh, but, but the reason that, that that doesn't work for me, but golf does, golf is a physics puzzle, which is also a score chase. Uh, I've enjoyed golf, not, not real golf, by the way. I want no part of that. Uh, don't get me started on actual real world physics of things. Golf is insane in real world, but, but virtual golf I've enjoyed for quite some time, going way back to the Lynx games. Uh, and I still enjoy it as, like I said, a physics puzzle with a high score chase. So when you put that in the context of an RPG, like Golf Story does, I'm in, I'm on board. Uh, so my counter recommendation uh, for Pyre um, is not a, uh, oh, you know what? I'm just going to counter recommend one of my favorite golf RPGs, Trevor. Uh, Hot Shots Golf, I think pretty much in any incarnation. Although I wonder how much of that had to do with the fact that it was on the PSP, like that it was a portable thing. There should be a Hot Shots Golf for the Nintendo Switch. Oh, there is Golf Story. Uh, but my counter recommendation, if you can find a Hot Shots Golf, that was a great pure golf RPG. You know, golf story, you run around, you talk to people and you explore the overworld and eh, I can take or leave that. But Hot Shots Golf, pure golf, pure RPG, wedded together as one. There's my counter recommendation, Trevor Apple. Number four, Sandu Bogey Nas says, Oh, bogey. <laughs> Please review the artwork of Jean-Michel Basquiat. And he gives me very specific instructions, which I appreciate because, by golly, I'm out of my element at this point. Uh, and which one you prefer, if any at all, uh, at all, as your top three choices and why? Basquiat. All right. Well, that's going to be number four. You can see where this is going, right? With the random number generation. So uh, everything I know about Basquiat uh, basically is nothing. I know that he was played by Jeffrey Wright in a biopic. I don't even know what it was called. You know, prob probably Basquiat, <laughs> is that, that makes sense. Uh, so I know nothing about Basquiat. Uh, so I'm gonna have a hard time. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce it. Basquiat, I must have heard that somewhere. Uh, I would know what to counter recommend, Bogey. So what I'm instead going to counter recommend is Jeffrey Wright and uh, my, my favorite recent Jeffrey Wright performance. It's not Westworld, by the way. Here's my impression of uh, Jeffrey Wright in Westworld. I just look confused. <laughs> That's also, by the way, my impression of me watching Westworld. Uh, Jeffrey Wright is in a movie that I think I would call maybe Forest Noir, although that whole idiom gets overused. Uh, it's a movie with Sam Rockwell called One Single Shot, 
and you'll know the scene when you see it, but there is a tremendous Jeffrey Wright scene. The guy uh, just knocks my socks off in that movie. So uh, one single shot. Uh, so Basquiat, thank you, Bogey. Number five, we have Jarmo Pereyaho, who I, I, am I butchering your name every month? I must be, because I think I do it differently every month. He says, Dungeon Alliance, a brand new board game dungeon crawler by Andrew Parks. Looks like a cross between One Deck Dungeon and Mage Knight. He says his copy arrives in a couple of days. By the time this has been filmed, he will have received his copy. Congratulations, Yarmo. Uh, he says, ah, I see you already have it. Uh, he just started watching the Tom vs. Bruce video, and there it was in the pile. So it goes, Yarmo says. Uh, so, Yarmo, uh, I hate to do this. Well, first of all, let's do this. Dungeon Alliance. Number five, your vote is wasted, Yarmo. I will be reviewing Dungeon Alliance anyway. Uh, but my counter recommendation, Andrew Parks, uh, and, and you're calling Dungeon Alliance uh, one deck dungeon crossed with Mage Knight. Uh, I don't really get the one deck dungeon uh, part of that. Certainly Mage Knight. There's a lot of Mage Knight in Dungeon Alliance. Normally that would be a complaint it is not in the case of uh, uh, Dungeon Alliance. I think Andrew Parks is, a, is a, a great game designer for a very specific type of game, and Dungeon Alliance is that type of game. Uh, he also has done a deck builder called Core Worlds, which I like a lot, and I'm going to counter-recommend Yarmo. Yarmo says, by the way, as it happens, uh, I watched Baba Black Sheep on TV in my childhood. This was mentioned on last month's video. Uh, all I remember from it was the planes taking off from some tropical island and there not being enough air battles for my taste. Uh, Yarmo, I imagine, I, that's kind of how I remembered as well. Uh, and I imagine, too, the air battles were just the same footage of these vintage airplanes used over and over and over again. And the footage was basically, you know, a plane would bank and maybe pop smoke to represent getting shot down, and then planes would cry. And they would, it, it was basically editing of plane footage that's supposed to trick you into thinking a battle happened. That's what I'm guessing that was way back when. Uh, so, all right, Jarmo. Core Worlds. I heartily recommend it if you appreciate Andrew Park's design and if you like deck builders. Uh, don't get too crazy with the player count. Core Worlds is a super, most of Andrew Park's games design, game designs are super brain burners and Core Worlds bogs down a lot if you get too many people. I would say max it out at three, only do four if you have people who take their turns quickly and get the expansion. Number six, Alex Chapman says, you have to play Breath of the Wild. Oh. <laughs> he says, it's just a beautiful game with an amazing sense of exploration. The puzzles are just the right difficulty to allow you to progress without feeling too frustrated. The combat is fine, but not Dark Souls good or difficult. I really think you would enjoy it and, not, uh, and regret not playing it sooner, Alex Chapman writes. Oh, Alex Chapman, I, I don't know. I, okay, I mean, it's perfectly legitimate uh, review request. It is, by the way, also number six. Uh, so, Alex Chapman, the thing about Breath of the Wild that uh, I've seen a little bit of it. I watched basically someone showed me very briefly his game, and he's like, you can do this, and you can do that, and here's the map, and here's the inventory. And nothing that I saw made me want to play it. But I keep hearing how it's really good at exploration. Now, here is my issue with uh, exploration. I recently played a game. Here's my counter recommendation, Alex Chapman. Uh, if you like exploration, and if you don't mind risk with your exploration, which I think is uh, a fundamental part of exploring, there should be some danger. You should stand to lose something. You know, exploring could turn out, you could discover a new world, or you could agara the wrath of God it, uh, and everything could be lost. Uh, and not many games do that because they want exploration to be easy and fun and forgiving. Uh, but one of the recent games I played where I really enjoyed how risk was folded into the exploration, Metal Gear Survive. Not a great game in certain ways, but it did something with exploration that I wish more games would do, and that I doubt Breath of the Wild does. They're 
can't be any risk in that game, right? Uh, but okay, so uh, we have you for uh, number six, Alex Chapman for uh, Breath of the Wild. Number seven, Sam Spackman. Oh, Sam. He says, what quarter to three needs more of is 80 Aussie monster movies. So my choice this month is Razorback. Sam Spackman. Ooh, okay, well, first of all, that. Lucky number seven. Do you guys do that little crosshatch on the seven? Is that annoying and contrived? It's a little affectation I picked up at some point. Uh, it's supposed to set it apart from just the number one. If your handwriting is so bad that you need that, you should probably do it. Mine is. So, Sam Spackman, Razorback. Uh, I think Razorback, either Razorback or The Car are my favorite Jaws remakes or ripoffs or homages. Uh, so, Razorback is uh, written by Everett DeRoche. I don't think he directed it. Uh... Van Der I don't know who directed Razorback, I don't remember, but it definitely is written by uh, Everett DeRoche, an Australian uh, horror science fiction writer with a, a very long and somewhat erratic career. But when Everett DeRoche is on, boy is he on. Uh, he wrote the movie Fortress, which, uh, is that Michael Mann? That can't be. Uh, it has a trippy Tangerine Dream soundtrack, which might be why I think it's Michael Mann. Uh, he wrote the movie uh, Road Games, Stacey Keach and Jamie Lee Curtis, an Australian road movie slasher horror thing. Uh, but my favorite Everett DeRoche movie, and it's very much 70s cinema, uh, it's, it's uh, fraught with uh, meaning and metaphor, but not, not preachy, not like over the top. Uh, but it's a really weird movie called The Long Weekend. I think it's just Long Weekend. There's a remake. Don't watch the stupid remake. Uh, the remake just misses the point uh, entirely. But Sam Spackman, if you haven't seen Long Weekend, uh, it can be a challenging watch, but I really recommend it. Uh, and that movie freaked me out as a kid. Uh, and I think it's the best thing Everett DeRoche has, has written. Uh, all right. Patrick Mullen, number eight, says, um, my new request system is whatever game I'm playing, I will request that month. Patrick Mullen, that is fine. I am happy to, to take whatever requests by whatever methods you choose. He says, of the mini games on my dance card, I choose Yom Kippur. And he gives me a link to someplace called Multiman Publishing. So, uh, Patrick Mullen, number eight. Uh, he says, if selected, I will purchase your copy. No, Patrick Mullen, that you support me on Patreon. You don't have to buy me anything. Uh, I will purchase your copy, walk you through how to play online. This is an online game? Uh, and then we'll play online. Uh, oh, the places will go, the people will see. And he says, no cheating on the counter recommendation by picking something I've played with Bruce Garrick. Why is that cheating, Patrick Mullen? I, I don't know why that's cheating. Uh, Patrick Mullen, all the games that you would like, I think, that I would counter-recommend are things I've probably played with Bruce Garrick. Um, so I had to think way back to an early, uh, well, also, first of all, the Yom Kippur reference. Uh, and second of all, uh, as far as uh, strategy games that play at a kind of a board game level that I think you would appreciate, I remember a game called Conflict Middle East. Uh, from way back, uh, I don't, I'm not even sure if it was on the Apple that I played on the Apple 2GS. I might have. Uh, I'm sure you could find abandoned wear copies of it. But Conflict Middle East had you playing as Israel, and it was a sort of grand strategic scale. Each turn was like, like a month, and you would issue diplomatic orders and military orders. Uh, you were trying to either avoid or incite war with different Arab countries in the region. Uh, and I just remember it having a, uh, it, it wasn't move a bunch of units around on a hex and try to capture a victory point. Uh, so conflict Middle East, don't know if it holds up, but Patrick Mullen, that's my counter recommendation. You chose Yom Kippur, I choose plain Israel in uh, conflict Middle East. Middle East. Number nine, Andrew Shi. Last month he says, Someone, not me, nominated Seiki Gahara. That was a good idea, so I'll nominate Seiki Gahara. Number nine. Uh, this deck of cards is, uh, can you see that? I, 
just a deck of regular cards that I actually bought in the Czech Republic a long time ago. I don't know why I did this. Um, and I've never used them. I, I don't have any use for cards like this, so we're going to mark them up. All right, Andrew Shee, he says, uh, I re as far as Seiki Gahara goes, uh, I really like how it emphasizes the importance of political alliances to military victory. <clears throat> the design notes in the manual, I love design notes, provide a very lucid explanation of the designer's goals, and I'd say he achieved them. Uh, Andrew Shi, uh, so this Seiki Gahara thing, you guys are just getting me more and more curious. It's a block game. Uh, I don't know what to make of that. Uh, but as far as Andrew Shi, uh, games about Japan, this makes me think of a movie about Japan I saw recently, and it was set in Japan. But one of the things that I wasn't really clear on is why did this need to be set in Japan? What did it bring to the story? At the time, I didn't think it necessarily brought much. But upon reflection, uh, I think there's more there than I thought. And specifically, a good friend of mine named Ian Slutz sent me an email saying, here are some really cool reasons that this is a Japanese setting. So I'm gonna recommend a movie called Isle of Dogs, a uh, Wes Anderson cartoon. Andrew Shee, there's my counter recommendation. Number 10, Armando Penblade does not seem to realize that he won the request drawing, the uh, Patreon review request drawing. Here's a 10. You kind of can't tell, but it's a 10. Looks like I.O. Uh, Armando Penblade says, it's time to begin copy pasting uh, my nonsense month to month. He says, because laziness is one of my seven defining traits. Another one is hair, he says. And if you've seen pictures of Armando Pinblade, he's not kidding. Uh, and he says, I really want you to review Dead Half Skates by Steven Erickson, blah, blah, blah. He writes the same thing he's written for, I think, three or four months ever since it actually won. So uh, this will be reviewed if it gets picked again today. I don't know what to make of that, Armando Pinblade. Uh, but uh, there you go. Armando Pinblade, you've won. You can pick something different now. <laughs> At any rate, that's number 10. Uh, number 11, Colton Westrate says, Nolf, because the world needs more Nolf awareness. All right, Colton Westrate, I need to have a talk with you, but first, number 11. Colton Westrate, I don't know how old you are. Maybe you're my age. Uh, but I think it's very important that uh, you understand that kids these days won't know what you're talking about when you say Nolf. It's time to start calling it by its full name. No one lives forever. All right, is that too many syllables? You can manage that. Between you and me, sure, a little shorthand, we both know what we're talking about, but if you wanna spread the word of Nolf, don't call it Nolf. <laughs> so no one lives forever, a great choice. Here's my question, no one lives forever or no one lives forever too? Uh, I actually, aren't they of a piece? Is that one of those games where there are people who are like, eh, the first one's better. Uh, you know what, I might just have to play both to find out if it gets selected. Colton Westrate, great, my counter recommendation. So this was Monolith uh, back in their heyday. Uh, they made Painkiller before it was called Painkiller and it was called Blood. Uh, after playing this build engine game called uh, Ion Maiden, which I don't really see the appeal of, uh, I recommend Blood, because I can imagine that holds up just for its over-the-top, wacky, horror movie themes. Um, all right, Colton Westray, thank you. Great, great request. Number 12, oh, number 12. I'm still getting used to this whole two-camera thing. Hi, Tom. I'm going to forward last month's choice again, he says. The wrong side of town, a Van Damme flick. He says, I'll get a bit more creative next month. Dave Sell, I'm happy. Re repeat requests are fine. You're not lazy, you're determined. I admire that. It makes me even more curious about this Jean-Claude Van Damme movie. Uh, and that's number 12. Oh, look, Dave Sell, you got an ace. Oops, it's upside down. Number 12. Uh, he says, I'll get a bit more, oh yeah. He says, and I will check out the Dolph movie you suggested as a counter. We can consider it this month's counter too, he says. Dave Sell, no. No repeat counter recommendations. Not gonna happen on my watch. Uh, as a side point, I think it was in the Patreon video, may have been the podcast, that you suggested Turbo Killer. 
All I can say, Dave Sell writes, is wow. Dave Sell, that is the correct response to Turbo Killer, uh, Seth Ekerman and Carpenter Brute. It's a, a music video for Carpenter Brute track called Turbo Killer, made by some uh, ingenious French fellows who called themselves Seth Ekerman. Uh, Dave Sell, and this is very well put, Dave Sell, says it just oozes sex and desire and awesomeness. It's freaking good. Yeah, so t t Turbo Killer, I, I, like, I could just watch that on a loop for hours on end. Uh, Dave Sell, my counter-recommendation, uh, I'm not sure what Dolph Lundgren movie I recommended. Not Shark Lake, right? Was it the one where Denise Richards plays an air marshal? Because that was kind of a tongue-in-cheek, like, oh, this movie's so bad, counter-recommendation. Here's, uh, here's what I think the latest Jean-Claude Van Damme movie is that you should see. And it doesn't star Jean-Claude Van Damme, interestingly enough. But it is what I believe Jean-Claude Van Damme's movies were back when they were made. And that's a movie called Lady Blood Fight. There you go. And that one completely unironic. I'm absolutely sincere when I counter-recommend Lady Blood Fight to anyone who wants uh, some fella on the internet to review a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie. Lady Blood Fight. Number 13. David Short, who gets uh, unlucky 13, a man of few words says, you are dead to me until you watch Firefly. <laughs> I kind of, at this point, uh, enjoy the reactions I get from people when I say I've never seen Firefly more than I would enjoy watching Firefly, maybe? Am I selling it short? Uh, all right, David Short, my counter recommendation. Uh, have you seen Star Trek Discovery? because I have, well, some of it. Started watching it and uh, petered out halfway through and then read spoilers about the season and now it's kind of, uh, now it's dead to me. Uh, I, which is a shame because the spoilers I read made it sound pretty cool. But there's my counter recommendation uh, for you Fireflyists. I believe that's what you call themselves. Uh, red shirts, isn't that what you Firefly fans call yourselves, red shirts? So all you red shirts out there, check out Star Trek Discovery. Number 14, Matthew Jameson writes, I've been waiting since September to recommend Revenge, the debut film from Colleen Fargeet. I think she's uh, Coralie. <laughs> I butchered that. Coralie Fargeet. Uh, easily my favorite from last year. Don't watch the trailer. It goes into some real spoiler territory, but be prepared for an intense ride. Also, lots of blood. Uh, Matthew Jameson. <clears throat> Your vote is wasted. It's already reviewed, as, as you may know. Uh, but your request, 14. I don't know what to do with these, like uh, Armando Penn Blades, Death House Gates vote, this revenge vote. Uh, if they get drawn, I, you know what? We'll burn that bridge when we get to it. Matthew Jameson, my counter recommendation, uh, a movie called Happy Hunting. Not quite as over the top or stylized as revenge, but... Uh, a similar idea, uh, and I like it quite a lot, Happy Hunting. I reviewed it on quarter to three. Uh, it's, um, well, you know, I won't say, I won't say anything else. Uh, so, uh, and Revenge is, is uh, pretty amazing. Number 15, Soren Hoagland says, I was toying with changing it up for this month, but now that it's mathematically guaranteed to win, I'm just going to have to make it Yakuza Zero. Maybe you've heard of it, he says. That's Soren Hoagland. 15, and I wrote it sideways. Um, Soren Hoagland, uh, if we're going to get into uh, Japanese storytelling, uh, I will counter recommend, and uh, I think you would appreciate this. There is a, a Kiyoshi Kurosawa, no relation, a movie called Daguerreotype. Um, which is a bit of a slow burn. It's basically a Victorian ghost story. Um, but what I like about it, uh, there's a Belgian actor named Olivier Gourmet, Oliver Gourmet, uh, who I really like from a movie called The Sun. Uh, but more importantly, uh, an Algerian actor named Tahar Rahim, uh, who I've seen recently in Looming Tower, who I also really like in The Lead. Uh, but it's a French language Victorian ghost story. It's slow, but weird, as you could expect from Kiyoshi Kurosawa. Uh, and Soren Hoagland, you 
might appreciate it. So there's my counter recommendation. But yeah, Yakuza Zero, mathematically guaranteed to win according to math that I have performed. So you're right. I don't even know why I'm bothering with this. It's going to get chosen, right? We'll see. Number 16, Lucas Necessary says, we both loved the movie Wind River. Let's make this... So 16, uh, well, let's wait and see what it is actually. Uh, I was especially taken by the thought of quote, mining for oil, as I think you termed it in the podcast, made my day. Uh, I'm not sure why, because there's like a mining camp and it's oil that they're digging up. So they're mining for oil, right? That's my recollection of Wind River. <laughs> um, he says, I'd love for you to review the show Longmire, or more specifically, the character Malachi Strand Malachi Strand sounds like some uh, a vampire from True Blood. There's really somebody named Malachi Strand in Longmire? All right. Uh, especially keeping Wind River in mind. Uh, I love this show, not only because most of the actors are truly awesome in person. Uh, in person? Does that mean you have met them, Lucas, necessary? In which case, do tell. Uh, he says, I love him uh, not only because most of the actors are truly awesome in person, but also because it has so many Native Americans in the cast. All right, very cool. So, uh, Lucas Necessary, the time was before there were controversies like uh, Jonathan Price being in Madam Butterfly, uh, and certainly we see more of them today. I remember uh, there, was a, there was a movie that I recently rewatched that uh, I think holds up in that it's weird, it's different. Uh, it's a fun Albert Finney performance. Uh, there's a Tom Noonan appearance, which is great. Uh, it has an odd ending. Uh, it's based on a Whitley Stryber story, and Whitley Stryber is his own brand of goofball. But I think the movie is less a Whitley Stryber book and more of a kind of a weird 70s slash 80s detective horror movie. Uh, a movie called Wolfen. Uh, and Lucas Necessary, I, I, I recommend this, counter-recommend this, because in Wolfen, there's a Native American character who may or may not, I don't want to spoil it, be a shapeshifter. And this Native American character is played, and this would have coincided with his appearance in Blade Runner, is played by Edward James Olmos. So a Hispanic character uh, back in the day playing an Asian fella in Blade Runner and a Native American fella in uh, Wolfen. Uh, and it's really funny seeing him so young, too. Uh, so uh, Lucas Necessary Wolfen, a really odd uh, 80s, 70s, uh, very 80s uh, horror movie. 82? Um, so there you go. Number 17, Donald Huckle. I'd like you to review the book Austerity, the History of a Dangerous Idea by the economist Mark Blythe. Yikes, <laughs> Donald Huckle. Um, okay. 17. Austerity, the History of a Dangerous Idea. He then asks, are there specific things you like to review? From what I've seen, most of the requests you get are movies, books, or games. Uh, Donald Huckle, anything is fine. We've had restaurant requests. Uh, Bogey one month requested that I, I uh, file my name in terms of running for the California, uh, for a congressman, which thank God that didn't get picked. Uh, considering what actually just happened here in California, we dodged a bullet there. Uh, I would have hated to throw my own name in there and muddy up the waters even further, right? Um, so, uh, Donald Huckle, man, I don't, I, okay. I'm curious, I'm curious why you request this, Donald Huckle. Uh, so, I don't know what to do with this is for a counter recommendation. Now, austerity. That word does make me think of my recent experience with austerity. Uh, there's a game called Battletech, a turn-based uh, mech strategy game, which I really like. And in it, you are managing a mercenary company of uh, mech warriors, right? And one of the settings that you can set is every month you determine what you're paying your crew. And you can pay them. It's a scale of terms. You can pay them like lavishly or stingily, and there's a continuum. And you choose one of, I think it's five settings. Middle of the road is you're just paying them what they expect. If you pay them more, their morale goes up. If you pay them less, their morale goes down. 
Now, morale in this game, I think the default is like 25 when you start. Uh, and it basically unlocks special uh, uh, moves, special attacks in the, the turn-based part of the game, which are no big deal. And they kind of unlock regardless of whether your morale starts at 25 or 24 or 23. So what I started doing in Battletech, a very poorly documented strategy game, by the way, uh, Hairbrain Studios needs to work on that. Uh, your morale's right at 25 by the default, and if you actually boot it down, it just gives you a minus one. If you boot it down more, it gives you a minus two, and that's the lowest it can go. And I was thinking, I don't, a morale of 23 versus 25? Yeah, I'll take that if it's gonna save me some money, big deal. Because I think when morale gets to 100 or something, you get a special move, maybe 30, I don't know. At any rate, I was having no problem filling up the morale bar during battles. So I was like, yeah, I'll shave two points. I'll go from 25 to 23 and save a lot of money that I can spend buying stuff. Um, so I did that. Basically, I imposed austerity on my crew. And at a certain point in the game, I noticed that my morale wasn't 23. It was something like 11. Because what I didn't realize is this negative two penalty accumulates every turn. So my experiment with uh, financial austerity with my mercenary company did not go very well. But I counter recommend Battletech, which is really good. Uh, Donald Huckle, I hope you like strategy games. That's what Battletech is. Number 18, Tom Ross says, Hey Tom, I request a review of Comedy Bang Bang's Best of 2017 podca uh, podcasts, plural. You've seen Andy Daly as Forrest McNeil in review. Yes, love that guy. Now you can hear some of his other work. At least one of his episodes usually ends up in the Best of special, plus, plus a bunch of other lunatics. <sighs> Tom Ross, Tom Ross, Tom Ross. All right. Comedy Bang Bang is the uh, invention, creation, three-ring circus of a fellow named Scott Aukerman, who I find singularly unfunny. As a performer, I should say. Uh, now, Scott Aukerman behind the scenes, uh, and he organizes great guests. He, uh, you know, he's got connections in the comedy industry, not because he's funny, maybe he is funny to some people, I just find him annoying. Uh, he's a very, He's not a very generous, you know, I don't, I don't. Anyway, Scott Ackerman's Comedy Bang Bang, Best of 2017. All right, Tom Ross. Uh, but to be fair, he does, you know, Paul F. Tompkins, Andy Daly. I, okay, I'd be curious to see what Comedy Bang Bang is doing lately. I haven't listened to it in a while because I can't stomach Scott Ackerman. Is he still even on it? So my counter recommendation, Tom Ross, where Scott Ackerman fares best is behind the camera. And the Between Two Ferns series that he's done with Zach Galifianakis, uh, there's some ingenious stuff there because he knows how to capture the unique comedy and appeal of Zach Galifianakis. So specifically, I'm going to counter recommend the Charlie's Theron and uh, um, uh, Bradley Cooper episodes. They're, they're both uh, amazing little three-minute nuggets of uh, filmmaking and comedy. All right. Number 19, Jason McMaster requests Bob's Burgers. And that's all he writes. That's all he needs to write. There you go. Number 19. I know Bob's Burgers. It's, one of the, it's, a, it's a pinball table in Pinball FX3. I don't know why he's singling out that pinball table. I've played it. It's nothing great. The theme is of uh, uh, people running a restaurant, which is an interesting theme for a pinball table. But I'm happy to review it, Jason McMaster. All right. McMaster must love pinball. Uh, McMaster, my counter recommendation as far as one of the really cool tables on Pinball FX3, uh, uh, Starfighter Assault. It is a Star Wars themed pinball table in which you choose to fly either a TIE fighter or an X-Wing and you do missions. Uh, I like it quite a bit. And I defy you to beat my high score. Number 20, Bruce Garrick says, okay, this time I would like you to review, and here's his number 20, Theo Angelopoulos' film, Ulysses Gaze. It has Harvey Keitel, who I know is your favorite. Bruce Garrick writes. I don't know why he thinks Harvey Keitel is my favorite. Uh, it has Erland Josephson, who is my favorite, Bruce Garrick writes. 
Erlen Josephson, Josephson is your favorite, Bruce Garrick. Favorite what, actor? I guess, I guess if he's in Ulysses Gaze. All right. Uh, he says, I'm not sure what I actually think about this movie. Robert, e uh, Roger Ebert, uh, apparently Roger Ebert says it's good. Uh, I, Bruce Garrick, you're having some issue with your autocorrect here. Here's what Bruce Garrick literally wrote. Roger Ebert hates in, Roger Ebert hates it, which means it is good. Oh, hates it. <laughs> I just figured that out. It says Robert e Roger Ebert Hayes, like the name Hayes. Roger Ebert hates it, which means it's good. All right. Uh, I hope this gets chosen. If it does, he says, you cannot just confessions of St. Augustine it. Bruce Garrick, uh, I defy you to find a video game site that has written more thorough coverage of the Confessions of St. Augustine. You cannot do it. Quarter to three's coverage of Confessions of St. Augustine, it is thorough, it is complete, it is insightful, it is unique. Tell me, don't Confessions of St. Augustine. How dare you? I should rip this in half, but I'm not. Uh, all right, my counter recommendation, Bruce Garrick, if you like Greek uh, filmmaking, um, I, so I know you tried to watch this fellow's movie, The Lobster, and you couldn't uh, because of a certain uh, scene. You bailed on it. You're like, this isn't for me. Uh, I don't think there's any similar scene in Killing of a Sacred Deer, but there's my counter recommendation. I would love to know what you think of uh, Killing of a Sacred Deer. Number 21, Chris M. writes, Chris M., you get a joker. These are not wild. This card is a 21. For this month, I'll go back to Jimmy Corrigan, world's greatest kid, brightest kid, smartest kid, whatever, Jimmy Corrigan, it's a comic book. Uh, Chris M, uh, so our little thing that we have going, Chris M is just repeatedly choosing things that he think I would like, which is great, and I'm just gonna counter-recommend things that I think he would like that aren't necessarily related. Uh, Chris Markinson, watch Killing Eve, uh, written by Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Uh, and remember the name Jodie Comer. Actually, you don't have to remember it, because once you watch Killing Eve, you will not forget it. 22. Uh, Yogi Bhandari, and this is his first month participating, welcome Yogi, says, uh, am I allowed to request that you make YouTube videos in the style of Mark Brown's Game Maker Toolkit? If not, he continues, am I allowed to request that you do more podcasts with Rob Zachney? If not, he continues, am I allowed to request an old DS slash 3DS strategy RPG called Devil Survivor? Yogi, you are allowed all three. Uh, and I guess I would start with the top, the Mark Brown's Game Maker Toolkit. Uh, I don't have control over whether I do podcasts with Rob Zachney. And uh, man, do I? I'm sure I still have a 3DS around here somewhere. I think it's in one of those drawers over there. Uh, Devil Survivor, I don't know it. Yogi, those are all perfectly fine picks. Uh, you can request anything. That is the only review of the user request counter recommendation Patreon video thingy, uh, is that you can request anything. And I will deal with what you've requested as best I can. Um, so uh, Yogi, I'm gonna put this down as videos in the style of Mark Brown's Game Maker Toolkit. Uh, so, Yogi, I looked these up and, and watched some of them, and it's number 22, by the way. Uh, it looks like the fella is just doing some pretty insightful commentary on the principles of game design, um, which would be a tough act to follow, because he, he seems to do a great job with it. Uh, but okay, Yogi? Oh, my counter recommendation. So the things you asked for are uh, insight into game design. Uh, Rob Zachney does uh, Three Moves Ahead, which is a strategy game podcast. So I'm assuming you're into strategy games. And this 3DS thing, Devil Survivor, which has got to be a JRPG, right? When I think of those three things together, uh, uh, game design, good game design, the principles of good game design, strategy games, and JRPGs, one title comes to mind for me, Disgaea 5. Uh, it's a really solid game design. They do some clever things in there. It's a really solid strategy game. And boy, does it have some JRPG trappings, which I actually don't mind in it. Uh, so there's my counter recommendation. Finally, number 23, Eric Geigner. Oh gosh, I've got ink on my hand now. That's the danger with these pens. If you're not, if you don't, uh, if you don't practice, oh, 23, here we go. If you don't practice uh, discipline around this area, uh, you're liable to walk away marked. 
Uh, 23, Eric Geithner says, I'd love to see a review, 23, of Seventh Continent. I kickstarted this, but for some dumb reason, I chose to have it shipped later this year. Eric Geithner, how dumb of you. I did the same thing. I'm so annoyed. I blame, I blame the wording, the, the confusing wording when you fill out the little backer confirmation because I was super excited to play Seventh Continent. There's no way on earth that I cared about saving $8 by having it ship all together in October versus two parts where, you know, uh, last month I would have gotten the first part and then in October the expansion. There's no way I would have chosen to do what I did. I'm in the same boat as you, Eric Geithner. I blame them. And I even sent them an email saying, uh, where's my copy of the game? And they were like, oh, well, you told us you wanted us to wait until October, which, by the way, I don't know if you got the update, Eric Geithner. It's not October anymore. It's now pushed into 2019. So annoyed. I mean, it's not like I don't have a bunch of other games to play. But Eric Geithner, I'm in the same boat, and I can't believe it, because I was super stoked for Seventh Continent. I love the idea of what they're doing. Uh, so, uh, Seventh Continent will be 23. Uh, they did say, Eric Geithner, uh, that they're looking into options because presumably a bunch of people like us uh, got shanghaied by the, the confusing wording on their stupid backer forms or whatever. Because uh, it was this whole deal about first wave, one shipment. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, and he says, I'm pretty excited about the premise. I think you mentioned you have a copy. Uh, do not have a copy, but we'll have a copy at some point. Eric Geithner. So I'm going to put this down as a vote for Seventh Continent, which is kind of cheating because I'll probably write that up anyway. So Eric Geithner says, if I'm misremembering this, how about a review of a board game called Space Base? He says, I hear good things, but it looks mathy. Yikes. Uh, uh, you know what? We'll put, uh, I don't know what to do. Okay. Okay, we'll call it a, a vote for Space Base, right? Because Seventh Continent, I don't know. Wait, it's not going to arrive till next year. Uh, I'm sure I'll cover it anyway. All right, so Eric Geithner, my counter recommendation, Seventh Continent, what's fascinating about it to me and I imagine to you is it has this persistent campaign which is played out with cards. Because Seventh Continent, just cards, nothing but cards, right? So my counter recommendation, I recently reviewed it uh, at quarter to three. You might have seen this uh, uh, adventure, uh, uh, fantasy RPG played just with cards eh, and dice is kind of cheating uh, called the Pathfinder adventure card game Mummy's Mask. Uh, Eric Geithner, if you want something to tide you over until Seventh Continent as far as a persistent RPG system using cards, uh, Mummy's Mask is my counter recommendation. And those are the 23 choices. We are now going to use cards as our random number generator. I now have to uh, angle this down. Let's see. Hold on. I want to make sure you guys can see the fancy card play. All right, cards. Numbers 1 to 23. You see, right, here we go. Uh, I am going to shuffle these. There's a couple ways you can shuffle cards. Let's, let's see. Uh, I remember there's, of course, this one. Uh, my mother was so good with a deck of cards. I just vividly remember as a kid watching her do this shuffle and counter shuffle, which I can't do nearly as well. She could just so gracefully do it. And I can't really do it gracefully. So that, of course, is the classic way to shuffle. It's especially cool if you can get that little counter riffle going. Uh, it depends on the, the kind of cards you have and the number being shuffled. It's not always reliable, but it's the flashiest way to shuffle, I think. Uh, the other way to shuffle, of course, is this whole nonsense, right? Oh, God, I'm going to take forever. <laughs> and if you have a bunch of cards, it takes forever. But my feeling is this is sure to randomize things. Now, here's the deal, though. If I do this and then do this shuffle, have I just reset the cards? I don't know. Uh, and that's that's the other way to shuffle. I, th I think there's probably a name for it, multi-decking, I don't know, whatever. Uh, but that's the other way to shuffle. Uh, it's thorough. It shows that you're committed to getting them shuffled. And then there's this, which I'm not, I cannot do. I wish I could do it more gracefully, more quickly, which I can't. Uh, there's a couple of issues with this. Uh, first, and I didn't realize this, uh, a friend of mine got me with the stupidest magic trick. I should have seen this because I didn't realize, and this is so dumb, that when you do this shuffle, look here, 
you're basically letting your fingers grab the cards on the outside and the inside and you're lifting them out so that just the middle remain and then you're putting them here. And no matter how many times you do this, and I can't believe this was lost on me, the same card is on top. So here we have the six of spades. I can do this over and over and if I was really good at it, which I'm not, I could do it super fast, but it's all... <laughs> <laughs> I accidentally shuffled the cards. I'm terrible. I, oh, good. What? Wait, it's supposed to be no matter how many times you do this. I guess it is you have to be careful to make sure to grab the front one. All right, at any rate. So I've, I've done this a lot with cards when I'm playing card games, and it probably inadvertently, you know, left this on top. At any rate, that's another way you can do it. And now you could do it backwards, of course, but then the card on the back is, oh, see, I'm terrible at this. I have a good friend of mine, I'm so jealous of this. He can do it, I'm just gonna do it with my hands. He can do this really fast. It's just like boom, boom, boom. Like here, I'll take one. He just go like, like that. And it, it, it's like so snappy. That's actually the flashiest way to shuffle cards, but I can't do that. All right, so we've shuffled the cards. You can see it's above board. Uh, are you supposed to do this too? This is a Vegas thing. I don't know. We shuffled the cards. Uh, oh, here's the fourth way to shuffle. I invented this. We're gonna call this the chick shuffle. Uh, there's this, where you just kind of take the cards and you stick them in the middle. You take the top half and you stick them in the middle. See, I invented that. No, shoot. Okay, okay. normally, try to do it gracefully because people might suspect you of shenanigan. Ugh. All right, I'm still working on this method, uh, but that's the chick shuffle. All right, so there we go. Let's draw a card. Ready? The winner for this month's Patreon review request is... Should I draw a card or cut the deck? Let's just draw a card. All right, here we go. This is one more shuffle, one more shuffle. Uh, don't want to look at the bottom. Actually, that's the problem with that riffle shuffle, is you turn them up to tap the cards, and you can see what's on the bottom. Uh, so we're not going to do that. I'm just going to... You know, here's what I do when I'm playing a solitaire game on my own. I want to make sure things are shuffled. So bear with me. Let's just do this. Here we go. We don't know what's on the bottom. We don't know what's in the middle. Completely random. And I'm not going to shuffle it again after that. I'm going to cut the deck and draw. Here we go. Cutting the deck. Oh, good lord. <laughs> and the winner of this month's Patreon review request is... Oops. Four. The works of Jean-Claude, what's, what's his name? The works of, oh, Jean-Michel, Jean-Michael Basquiat. All right, you guys ready to have me uh, review paintings? He's a painter, right? Yeah, maybe he's a drawer. Uh, painter Jean-Michel Basquiat, I will be looking at his works and choosing my three favorite and explaining why thanks to the card random number generator. By the way, does anybody want some playing cards that are marked up? I, I have a set here. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, thank you again so much for supporting me like you do. Uh, this is just a joy for me to do every month-ish. Uh, keep the requests coming. Feel free to make repeat requests. Uh, and if you're watching this and you'd like to get involved, if you support me for $10 or more at patreon.com slash tomchick, uh, you'll get a message uh, every now and then saying, hey, give me a recommendation, give me a review request. I'll give you a counter recommendation. Thank you guys. I uh, hope you're going to have a good, great summer. I'll see you in about a month. And in the meantime, I'll be looking at some Basquiat. <laughs>